let's look a little bit about the connection between Lorentz transformations and hyperbolic functions that we discovered last time. Let's just do a numerical example. Remember, we did an example a couple videos ago about uh, velocity equals one half, and in particular, adding a velocity one half to itself, and of course not getting one, which was the new, the non-Newtonian surprise. Let's just uh, work out the numbers to see how that works here. We already figured out that gamma was two over root three for that example. That's not a hard calculation; you can do on your own as well. Um, and then we had a, a couple of formulas for alpha. One is it's the inverse hyperbolic tangent of v. So if your calculator directly does inverse hyperbolic tangents, then that's fine. And it turns out to be about 0.549. If you want to go back to um, a little more first principles, maybe, and you don't, or you don't have this on your calculator, we did have an alternate formula. It was ln of z, or ln of gamma of 1 plus v, or times 1 plus v. And so that's ln of 2 over root 3 times 3 halves or ln of, it all cancels down to root 3, or just a fairly simple number, uh, 1 half ln 3. And if you calculate that, again, it's a little bit more than a half. The way, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things I, I guess I didn't mention about the inverse tangent function, I, I sketched its graph. I didn't mention, though, that uh, when alpha is small, v and alpha are almost e equal, okay? So alpha is approximately equal to v in the Newtonian approximation when v is small. Which is nice, okay? Which makes sense. We know that v actually is very close to additive when v is small, and we know alpha is always additive, so it'd be annoying if they were they were different, but they are really close to each other. So it's not too surprising that this number is not drastically different from one half. Now this is getting pretty relativistic, certainly, and as soon as we add it to itself, we have to definitely take into account relativistic effects. We're going to be horribly wrong, but this alpha is not drastically different from uh, from 0.5. So. Um, let's go ahead and add that to itself. Let's see. Um, if we take, if we double alpha, let me just see what I can erase here. Well, let me, actually, let me erase everything and just rewrite a couple things. So we have v equals one half, and alpha equals um, one half. Ln three is 0 0.549. Then if I add to itself this idea of the trains coming toward me at half the speed of light and then somebody throws the baseball from that train at half the speed of light relative to the train, what's it going to end up as? What's the, the velocity going to end up as? Well, we're just going to double alpha. That's the great thing about additivity. You just double it. Add it to itself. And so it's actually exactly ln3 or approximately 1.098. Okay. So there's our new alpha. If we really wanted to get back to the corresponding velocity, the corresponding v, remember, that's the hyperbolic tangent of now the doubled alpha. And if you plug that in, it does come out to be 0 0.8. Our earlier calculation confirmed that that was supposed to be 4 fifths. Okay. So this is a very cool parameter, the alpha parameter. You don't have to um, worry about weird things about combining velocities. It's especially nice when you have combining velocity problems because it's, so ad it's, because it's additive. Okay. Let me try check one more thing. I'm not going to go through a, a big thing about hyperbolic functions right now, um, but I did want to compare something. Um, this I sort of the way I I did the calculation I got out of having to do this particular calculation, but we really should do it at least once. Suppose I have two Lorentz transformations, one with velocity parameter or rapidity whatever you want to call it, alpha, one, and the other one, actually, let's just call them alpha and beta. It's going to be easier. So one with alpha, one with beta, and that should be a beta now. And in the, uh, the Euclidean case, I noted that the fact that angles were additive was equivalent to the cosine and sine sum formulas. That's a really nice, deep fact about those formulas. That's why they kind of have to be true, or else angles wouldn't be additive. Well, let's multiply these together. You're going to get something that's rather similar that, to that calculation. Cosh alpha, cosh beta, those two, and then cinch cinch, but with a plus sign. Cinch alpha, cinch beta. And 
um, I'm just going to write the, the one down here, and then these guys are going to be just the same things but switched. So this is going to be cinch cosh, cinch alpha cosh beta, plus cosh alpha cinch beta. So it's very much like, and so these are guys, this goes here, this goes here. Um, very much like the addition formulas for sine and cosine, except this would, just take out the h's, and this would have been a minus sign. Um, so the claim is that this is cosh, and I've really proved this. If you unravel everything I've done, it amounts to a clever proof. Oh, and then, of course, same thing but switched. Uh, a clever proof that cosh alpha plus beta really is this, and cinch alpha plus beta really is this. And you can, there's various ways to prove it. You can grunge it out with the e to the alpha plus e to the minus alpha definitions. There's some kind of cool cancellations that happen. Um, there's some nice calculus ways to prove this. Um, or you can kind of unravel everything I've done and, and see that that's really, this has to be true for the angles to be additive. Because we know that these are how Lorentz transformations combine. We know that those angles were additive because that's how we found it. We first found something that was multiplicative, the z parameter, and then we took the log of it. And so this has to work. Um, but again, it's nice to see it in this kind of low-tech form that the one reason you can say that the, this parameter works and this way of parameterizing Lorentz transformations is so cool is because these are the correct ed addition formulas for cosh and cinch, and that corresponds to matrix multiplying to Lorentz transformations. Okay, so let me just say one more thing about that method. It's a little bit clever, this idea of um, physics, the physics idea it was very reasonable. It was to focus on light, or in other words, in terms of the geometry, we were focusing on the null cone, and we found what went, happened to that, and we discovered a, a new, a neat parameter, the a plus b, the z equals a plus b parameter, and then we discovered, we said, well, why not figure out how that behaves under combining transformations, and it turns out to be multiplicative, and then we were off to the races. Um, there's a mathematical, sort of an algebraic justification for that, that if you know some linear algebra, what I was really doing is I was finding, in a kind of an ad hoc way, an eigenvector, or realizing that a null vector must be an eigenvector for the Lorentz transformation, because it can't take a null vector to something else that's not null, because null vectors are special for the geometry. and uh, finding corresponding eigenvalue. And so implicitly, I didn't actually go through the whole thing, implicitly I came pretty close to diagonalizing the Lorentz transformation um, by basically looking at it in terms of uh, the null directions. Um, and you can, we could definitely take that further if we wanted to, but I'm not assuming much linear algebra, so I'll just leave that hanging in case you do know the linear algebra. And if you know how to do find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you can just take the Lorentz transformation, apply whatever method you know to do that, and you'll get the z and the e to the alpha t coming out. Okay. So speaking of z, the z was a plus b, or gamma times the quantity 1 plus v, and it relates to the, the rapidity by the alpha by z equals e to the alpha. Um, our goal was to analyze Lorentz transformations in general, and uh, the tool was to look at a null direction, but that's actually incredibly important for understanding light. Okay, So here's the thing about light, that two observers, two observers will agree on the velocity of light. That's the non-Newtonian thing. But they will disagree about its energy and momentum. So let's bring back dynamics one more time about the energy and momentum. Let's bring back the dynamics here. When we talked about dynamics before, we really actually did, I uh, was talking about material particles. I specifically avoided talking about light. But it's actually pretty easy. Um, if I look at the coordinates here, this guy is going to be some vector, if that's the, the, the energy momentum vector of a photon or some other massless particle. That's going to be e comma p, but you know what? It's got to be in a null direction. Let's say it's going up and to the right, just for simplicity. 
So to be in a null direction, these components have to be equal. It has to be along the 45 degree direction. So it's just E comma E. So in other words, for a photon, P equals E. If you want to put the C's in, it's not too hard to see that uh, it's going to be E over C to get the units right. But as usual, for me, C equals 1. OK, so there's E comma E. That's how I would describe it in this coordinate system has a certain energy and then its momentum is basically equal to its energy which is pretty cool nice simple equation well what about in the x prime t prime coordinate system well that's exactly what we were just doing we were analyzing uh, what happens when we take x prime t prime and look at this kind of vector and we just dis discovered that it just gets multiplied by by z okay let's just redo that real quick remember how that worked we had some mystery Lorentz transformation. We didn't worry too much about what the coefficients were, and we just multiplied it by EE, e, and that just multiplies. Uh, you get E times A plus B. I did it for 1, 1 before, but it works just for EE e just as well. Okay. And so that's just Z times EE. E. It still has to be of the same form where energy and momentum are equal. And the multiplier factor for momentum is exactly z. Or if we like to write things in terms of the additive parameter alpha, it's e to the alpha, e. e. Okay. So what this says is that uh, the x prime and t prime observer is going to see the uh, the photon with a different uh, energy and momentum multiplied by e to the alpha or z, and that's called the uh, red or blue shift parameter because if you just add in a tiny little bit of quantum mechanics then E is H nu or that's the frequency and this is Planck's unreduced constant because I'm using the the cycles per second frequency not the like radians per second okay and so what we get is that the new prime is going to be Z nu or e to the alpha nu. And what is that in terms of v? A little in the last video, I had the calculation for that. It's the square root of uh, 1 minus v over 1 plus v um, times nu. So that's the Doppler shift. So a nice uh, side effect of the way we de derive the Lorentz transformation is we actually kind of secretly derive the Doppler shift formula first because it was simpler, um, because null vectors are simple and nice and pretty and, and intrinsic to the geometry. And it turns out that that's um, the Doppler shift formula. So for example, if V equals 1 half, we've already seen the Doppler shift factor, uh, it was root 3, or about 1.73. So if something's coming towards you with relative velocity half the speed of light, you're going to see the photons coming out of it shifted by a factor of blue shifted by a factor of root 3. The, the frequency is going to go up by a factor of root 3. If you're, they're going away, it's exactly shifted by a factor of 1 over root 3. That's an interesting thing about the relativistic um, Doppler shift is that changing p toward to away motion is just changing the plus or minus alpha, and that's just z or 1 over z, taking z or z to the minus 1. And so it's got this very nice behavior of just uh, shifting by a certain factor or one over that factor. And that came out of the, the math in a very, very easy way. Okay. Um, I think probably just one more video, and I, that's going to finish just about what I'm going to have to say. But this is a good place to stop this one.